In today's video, I'll cover some of the key concepts introduced in The Lean Startup, the book by Eric Ries, where he talks about the whole process of doing experiments to learn and adjust your business model, and if necessary, do a pivot. Hang in there to the very end, and I'll cover 10 different types of pivots that you might need to consider to get your startup on the right track. Hi, I'm Steve Morris, and I use this Startup SOS channel to provide practical how-to advice for new entrepreneurs. With that, let's jump right into the lean startup. So Eric defines a startup as being a human institution designed to create new products and services under conditions of extreme uncertainty. The specific problem that Eric wanted to tackle is that far too many startups fail. And it makes sense, actually, because it is so complicated. There are a lot of critical assumptions you're making on which the success of your startup hinges. Some of those assumptions just aren't true. Now, Eric is certainly a believer in doing customer discoveries, including customer interviews, before you write any code at all or develop any product or service at all. But the problem he points out is that's generally not enough because interviews are abstract and the challenge is that customers don't always know exactly what it is they need. So the process of interviewing people, of doing customer discoveries through customer interviews, can certainly help you learn a lot and get you closer to delivering a product or capability that people will actually pay for, but it's often not enough. So what's needed is a way to give customers experience with the product, some actual hands-on experience, so they have something more concrete to react to than simply a Q&A uh, process of customer interviews. And the challenge of that, of course, is one of cost and time. I mean, the whole idea is you're trying to figure out the right product to develop. If you have to develop a product just to get customer feedback, only to find out that you developed the wrong thing, that's a little bit of a problem. So the challenge is, what do you do? Well, Eric took some inspiration from lean manufacturing, which was something developed originally in Japan and goes way back to some of Toyota's efforts right after World War II. And the lean manufacturing process focused on things like shrinking batch sizes of manufacturing. Toyota had to look at doing that after the war because they had limited access to resources. So they had to learn how to build smaller batches of things with less raw material available. And that required them also to figure out how to accelerate cycle time so they could build a small batch of this and then a small batch of something else. And the whole focus was on reducing waste because again, they had limited resources. They couldn't afford to waste any material. And that led to things like just-in-time production, uh, which reduces the amount of inventory you have to have on hand. You just have the inventory that you need right now, and you don't stock up on future inventory. And then finally was the Japanese approach of Genshi Gembutsu, which roughly translates as go see for yourself. So from a manufacturing point of view, that then, hey, don't assume you understand the problem. Go see what it is out on the production line. From a customer point of view, it might translate to, hey, go see what the customer thinks. Get the customer perspective. So now these are all manufacturing ideas, but Eric kind of tweaked them a little bit to apply to the actual product development concept. His challenge was to figure out how to test assumptions as inexpensively and quickly as possible. So the idea he came up with was to do small experiments. Um, this sort of relates to the idea of, of small batches in a manufacturing environment. And those small experiments would focus on putting into the customer's hands a capability, a really minimal capability, that at least let them test one or two or three key assumptions in the business model, as opposed to having just discussions, which are very abstract. The idea is to put something in the customer's hands that's more concrete that they can react to. Those small experiments he called MVPs, minimum viable products. So a very central notion in the lean startup is your minimum viable product is simply an experiment. It's an experiment that's targeted to testing one or a short list of critical assumptions in your business model. And you're probably going to do a series of them to test a series of assumptions or to optimize some critical parameters in your business model. So the idea is to put the MVP out there, 
measure the results in terms of the actual customer behavior, learn from that, and then iterate, go on to test the next set of assumptions or to further optimize the metric you're trying to optimize. So that leads us to the commonly seen uh, cycle of the lean startup, which starts with an idea, then you build the product, you measure the customer reaction to it, uh, you get that data and learn from it, and then apply that back to your concept. So very central to this whole idea of lean startup is testing hypotheses with actual experiments, in other words, with MVPs. And the approach that Eric takes is something he calls innovation accounting where you're doing experiments that are getting results that are actually actionable results uh, and results that are, that are accessible. In other words, accessible in terms of being actually understandable. So it's, it's sort of clear what it is you're measuring and that are auditable so that you can verify that yes, you, you actually are measuring the thing that you thought you measured that maps back on your business assumption. Now, specifically, these are not vanity metrics. A vanity metric would be just something that might make you feel better, but isn't really actionable. Uh, you know, for example, looking at total revenue. Well, your total revenue might be going up and that can make you feel better, but it doesn't give you anything actionable. If you look at some of the underlying metrics, like let's say customer conversion rates, well, maybe your revenue is going up, but what if your customer conversion rates are actually declining over time? Well, that's a sign that you have a problem uh, on the way, but that's actionable. If you see that kind of a decline in a conversion rate, you at least know what you can address or the, the actual problem that needs to be addressed in order to stop the decline ultimately in revenue. So that's the idea of, of actionable. You're looking to measure things that you can actually optimize and affect and improve uh, over time, as opposed to vanity metrics that might make you feel good, but don't really help you manage the business. So that gets also into his other concept of validated learning. Validated learning is learning that helps you improve a core metric. So for example, some kind of a conversion rate, maybe a, a registration rate or a conversion into a paid customer rate. You're measuring rates of change, specific metrics, so that you can learn from that do another experiment and learn how to improve it and eventually optimize your business model. So testing hypotheses with experiments, measuring things that are actionable, accessible, and auditable, and not vanity metrics, that's the key to doing validated learning that helps you actually improve your business model. And again, central to this concept, to doing experiments, is the idea of doing MVPs. In Eric's mind, that's what an MVP is. A minimum viable product is an experiment targeted to test one or more hypotheses. That's the purpose of doing an MVP. So let's get back to this simple model of idea to building a product, to measuring, getting data, learning, and back to the idea. If we apply some of these other concepts to dig a little bit deeper, the ideas actually here you're focused on are business hypotheses. You're building not just a product, but actually an MVP, a minimum viable product, the minimum thing you need to test that hypothesis or the hypotheses that you want to test in this round. So you're building the MVP to test a hypothesis. You measure the results by looking at customer behavior. Maybe it's a conversion rate. Maybe it's the accept this or they don't accept this. Whatever it is, it's customer behavior. And what you're measuring on the data side is information that's accessible, auditable, and actionable. And that leads not just to learning, but again, what he would call validated learning. And that may be yes, no kind of learning, like customers are willing to do this or they're not willing to do this. But more often, it's optimized type learning. It's saying, okay, we tried this change in the MVP and it improved a key conversion rate, uh, let's say from registration to actually using the product once or twice. That's the kind of thing you're often looking for is experiments to optimize, to improve your business model. Once you prove or disprove the hypothesis, then you're back to testing your next business hypothesis. So digging a little deeper, I think those are some of the ideas that are really core to the lean startup. So what hypotheses are you testing? Well, Eric would call them the 
key leap of faith hypotheses, the hypotheses that need to be true uh, for your business to, to really be viable. So what are the most critical assumptions that you've got uh, that you're depending on being true? Those are the things that you need to test. And usually the two most important categories to test will be the value hypothesis, the value proposition hypothesis, and the growth engine hypothesis. Now, the value proposition, just do you correctly understand what the value is and do you think your product is really delivering on that? Those are clearly key things to test. The growth engine hypothesis depends on what the key focus is for growth in your business. Eric divides growth engine into three categories. I think of these as, as three different th knobs that you can adjust to uh, affect your growth. One is stickiness. Once you get a customer, how likely are they to stay with you? Uh, and you're measuring that by looking at customer churn. How often do you lose customers? Clearly, if the critical thing in your, your growth model is to keep customers once you get them, you're looking for a low churn relative to your new customer acquisition rate. Now, another key knob uh, to, to dial in terms of growth would be viral. How many friends will each new customer bring along? Clearly, the more friends they bring along, the faster you're, you're, you'll grow as long as your churn rate isn't too high. And then the other approach to growth would be paid, uh, paid advertising to get new customers. Now, in that case, of course, what you're looking at is what did it cost you? What did it cost you to get the customer compared to the lifetime value of that customer? Clearly, if your advertising is costing you more than the lifetime value, you don't have a viable business model. So you have to either figure out how to reduce that cost of acquisition or increase the lifetime value of the customer. So those are some of the critical aspects to the engine of growth and some of the things you'll want to measure in order to adjust those different growth parameters. Now in innovation accounting, we talked about both having sort of yes, no kind of testing to figure out will customers be willing to do this or not. But then there's also the optimization where you're trying to say optimize a conversion rate. And you're trying different MVP experiments to see which approaches result in the better uh, conversion rates uh, on the customer side. So how do you do that? Well, clearly, if you're going to see MVP A versus MVP B and how to compare the two, you'll have to do one of two things. Uh, either a cohort test where you try MVP number one and see what the key conversion rate is that you're, uh, you're focused on. And then you put out MVP two, which has a change which you believe is going to improve that conversion rate and you measure whether or not the rate changed. So that's the cohort approach where you're simply doing MVPs chronologically, but making sure that you see how your metrics are changing with each MVP. Now, the other approach is the split test. Uh, this is very much like A-B testing in the advertising world, where you create two MVPs one of which is, think of as the base MVP, the other one is, is adjusted to where you believe you'll improve the targeted uh, metric that you're, uh, you're focusing this experiment on. And you deliver those MVPs to two different customer subsets. And you see how the two compare, see which one has the better conversion rate or are they the same? Did the tweak that you made in the one MVP actually improve the rate. So to optimize a metric, it's either going to be a cohort test over time or a split test trying the, uh, two different things out at the same time, but with two different customer sets. Now, a simple example of, of an experiment uh, would be the Zappos uh, example, which I think of as very much a yes-no test. The uh, founder of Zappos had a hypothesis that customers would be willing and ready to buy shoes online. Now, that absolutely was a hypothesis worth testing because at that point in time, the way people bought shoes was to go into a store, get their feet measured, uh, have somebody bring them shoes, try them on. You got to feel the shoe, examine the shoe, see if it fit. You got to do all of that before you bought it. Very different experience from buying online. So the question was, 
will people be willing to do this? Well, he wanted to, t to test that without developing a, a product, without investing in all of the infrastructure to create an online store, to get inventory, to advertise, etc. So he did a simple experiment. He got a local uh, shoe store to agree to let him come in and take pictures of shoes. He posted them online, and the agreement was if people bought them, then he'd come to the store and buy the shoes for the customer actually at list price. So he wasn't making any money, but he was testing that key hypothesis. Are customers willing to do this? And with very, very little expense, the expense of essentially creating a simple website where he could post uh, the shoes and then do a little bit of, of advertising, he was able to test that hypothesis. So let's compare that to doing a test where you're really looking at optimizing something, optimizing conversion rates, and so you're doing a cohort test. Maybe you're looking at, say, registration, activation, retention, and referral rates, and you create a first MVP, and you get these results. So registration, 5% of those that register, 17% activate, but the retention and referral numbers are really, really, really low. Okay, so you get some ideas in talking uh, to customers about what might improve that. You make some tweaks to the MVP and you put out MVP number two and you get some considerably better results. You can see registration rates improved to 17%, activation way up to 90%, and retention and referral are at least on the boards now with 5% and 4% respectively. Now, maybe that's good enough for the business model, maybe not. Maybe you do another experiment with MVP3 Again, based on talking to customers about these results, you get ideas on how to make it even better, and you keep experimenting until you get a good enough conversion rate to have a viable business model. Now, as Eric points out in the book, there are a lot of different kinds of MVPs, and some of them are definitely not what you would think of as an actual product. Uh, for example, uh, a marketing offer. Uh, the Zappos example was really close to being essentially a marketing offer. Put something out and see if people are willing to buy it. Well, that can test, as in the case of Zappos, a pretty important hypothesis, but it really doesn't involve uh, creating anything close to a functional product. Another approach to an MVP can be a video. I mean, let's say you have a, a software product that would involve a whole lot of development to actually be able to do a real demo, but what you can do is put together a demo that, that doesn't have functional software behind it, but has, let's say, slideware behind it, but at least that lets you walk a customer through what the product is going to look like and the steps they would go through to solve a problem. That's much more concrete than just talking to somebody about what the product would do. So that can be an example of an MVP. Again, uh, in the software world, that wouldn't involve writing any code, it just involves putting together uh, maybe a series of slides, putting that into a demo. Uh, there's then the, uh, the concierge uh, MVP, the MVP where literally, uh, maybe ultimately this is going to be, let's say again, a software and online thing, but you implement it by having people do the service every step of the way. Uh, and that way it's, it's not gonna involve writing any code, but it tests whether or not customers will be willing to buy the service. Now, if you have people implementing this every step of the way, uh, let's say, for example, let's say have a, a, a food uh, buying uh, service online, and instead of having it online, you actually walk up to customers with a form, uh, take their order, process it, and deliver it to, to them with, without having developed any website, anything at all. Uh, now, that's clearly really expensive, not sustainable, but you're testing whether or not the process can work. And you're testing a number of things through the process. The idea of what do you need to show the customer to let them make the selection, uh, how do you take the order, how do you deal with delivery, you know, uh, et cetera. There are a lot of things you can test without writing a single line of code. Another approach, uh, again, to a software product would be a wireframe. Uh, we talked about a video, maybe when you put together some slideware, a wireframe could be something where uh, the customer can maybe even uh, click the keys and, and see what happens, but underlying it, it's not really functional. It's just some buttons that know what to do when you press them. So it's still not full function. It's very inexpensive to put together compared to a product. So that can be another approach. And then finally would be 
a, a functional or a semi, a partly functional prototype of the product. Whether it's a software thing or a hardware thing, it would be just a partial uh, product, but specifically focused on testing a particular hypothesis. So any of these approaches can be an MVP, and clearly uh, some of them are a lot less expensive than others. Uh, and you, you want to do as many experience, experiments as you can at the inexpensive end of the scale uh, to learn more, to validate that there really is a there there before you go through and do the more expensive ones, like actually write some code and, and, uh, and put more of a, a functioning product, again, whether it's a software thing or a hardware thing in front of the customer. So be creative when you think about the idea of, of, of an MVP. And remember, an MVP is just something to test a hypothesis. So you're going to do the minimum that you can do to test that key, sort of the most important next hypothesis, or to optimize the, the critical parameter, the conversion rate that you're trying to optimize. Now, one question that often arises in thinking about the MVP from the, the point of view of it being an experiment is the MVP versus quality. Uh, a vision, of course, in a startup is you always want to produce something that's polished, that's slick, that's complete, that you're going to be proud of, that the customers will be happy with. And the reality is, if you use the lean startup approach, you're doing something that is absolutely minimal. It, it's almost certainly an incomplete product because it's testing a particular hypothesis or a short list of hypotheses. And it may be buggy. And to a lot of people, that really doesn't feel right, especially a lot of engineers. And I guess the thing to think about is, again, back to the example of lean manufacturing, work beyond what is required to start the learning that you need to, to, to complete is waste, right? You're, you're wasting time, you're wasting resources, and the challenge in a startup is you only have a finite amount of resource. You have a finite runway, a finite amount of money to burn through in testing hypotheses until you make enough headway uh, to, to have enough traction to go raise more money. So it's critical that you don't create waste. In other words, you don't expend effort that you don't have to in order to test the hypotheses that need to be tested. So, so yes, there is that trade-off between wanting to have a complete product uh, versus wanting to conserve cash and wanting to not develop a complete product until you test the hypotheses to make sure that you're actually building the right product. And the last topic that leaves is, of course, the pivot, pivoting versus staying the course. If you're doing these experiments and they're not working out, you're uh, actually getting a result that's in a, a yes, no test saying, no, customers actually aren't willing to, to buy a solution this way to solve this kind of problem. Or maybe you're optimizing your business model, your conversion rates, and you just can't get the conversions to the point where you have a viable business then it's time to seriously think about whether you should pivot, think about what you've learned, and uh, and decide in what way might you pivot. Now, deciding how to pivot obviously depends a whole lot on the specific situation that you have, and every company is different. But uh, making it even more complicated is that there are a lot of ways to pivot. So as promised earlier, let's go through that list of just some of the possible ways that a startup might pivot. So one type of pivot would be the zoom in pivot. Uh, again, let's say your product is addressing a lot of different capabilities and what you find out in customer feedback is actually by far the most critical thing is the, just one piece of that, one subset of it. And you can really improve your efficiency by just focusing in on delivering a product just to do that because people will pay for that. So that's the zoom in. Or maybe it's the opposite, a zoom out pivot. You're providing one specific capability. And what you realize in customer feedback is customers want more capability. You're not solving enough of the problem. So you need to zoom out and address a little bit more of the problem from the customer's point of view. Another would be a customer segment pivot where you learn through your experiments that there's a different customer segment than you'd originally uh, focused on that actually is an easier sell, is, is a segment that has the problem that you're solving and is ready to buy. So you shift to that different segment 
and the need may be somewhat different, so that may change what the product looks like, uh, but that's another uh, critical uh, type of change that may be required. Or a customer need to pivot. Maybe you decide in working with a particular uh, set of customers that actually they all have a different need than you originally realized that's much more compelling. And if you have the technology to address it, it may make sense to shift and address that other need. Or another option, the platform pivot. Especially in the software world, sometimes you're delivering a platform where people are developing their own specialized product on your uh, platform. And sometimes what you'll discover is, well, no, actually customers don't want a platform. They actually want a specific targeted solution instead of a platform on which to develop a solution. So that would be a pivot. Or you can discover the opposite. You're, you're delivering a very specific focused solution but what you learn is customers actually want a platform where they can develop a more targeted uh, solution that addresses their need. And that's sort of the opposite pivot then. There can be a business architecture pivot. Uh, let's say one, one example would be you have a business to consumer model. You thought you were developing a product for consumers. What you discover is for whatever reason, it's a much better proposition to sell to businesses who are gonna to sell to those consumers. So you're switching from a business to consumer to a business to business kind of model. Fundamental change in your architecture probably significantly changes uh, some of the attributes of the product that you're developing. Uh, a value capture uh, pivot is a, another example. Uh, this is where you decide that you're just charging the wrong way for the product. Uh, maybe uh, you thought you would charge as a subscription, but customers really didn't like that and would really prefer either a, a one-time purchase uh, or perhaps they'd prefer that you tax a transaction so you, you they pay each time they're using your product. So again, depending on the feedback from the customer, you may need to change the way you actually charge. It could be an engine of growth pivot. Again, we talked about those three different knobs in terms of the engine of growth uh, being stickiness uh, versus paid advertising uh, versus viral. Well, maybe you shift your focus from one to another based again on customer feedback. That too will probably change your product so that you're optimizing the different required optimization metrics for that particular growth approach. A channel pivot can be uh, another one where you simply realize that you are selling through the wrong channel. Switching channels, again, can require some changes to your product. And then finally, a technology pivot where you may discover that you're actually using the wrong technology. There's a better way to solve the customer problem. So you have to shift technology focus. Clearly, that's gonna have an impact on your product development. Those are just some of the different types of pivots uh, that might make sense. So de deciding between them and deciding when you need to pivot and why, yes, it is complicated, but it's one of those important things to consciously think about as you're doing these different experiments, these different MVPs to test out and optimize your business model. So those are some of the key ideas covered in the Lean Startup book. Use the link in the notes to get your own copy of the Lean Startup, and that is an affiliate link. The channel earns a small commission if you use that link. If this was helpful, please click the like button, share it with other entrepreneurs, leave a comment or a question. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that and click the notification bell because we always have more videos on the way. This video is part of what will be a series on entrepreneur books. There is a link to the playlist uh, for books right here. And that is a wrap for this time. Thank you very much for watching.